from Holly Gregory. I have a special guest joining us today, Senator Marco Rubio. Welcome back to Political Connections. Thank Good you. to see you again, to Senator. Back. We have lots to talk about. I want to get into the growing influence of China and some things that have happened this week, but uh, first some very pressing issues to get to when it comes to what is happening right now in northern Syria. Turkey has begun their assault. Um, the Trump administration decided to pull out some special forces from that region, and that is a decision that um, has drawn a lot of criticism on both sides of the aisle. I believe you called it morally repugnant because the Kurds are our allies. Um, is it more than just a moral issue here? Is this a strategical error? What do you think yeah, is happening? Yeah, it's moral, strategic, it's reputational. So let me first lay the groundwork for people about what, why this even matters, right? So. When ISIS was growing, we remember that, like ISIS was almost in control of parts of Iraq and large, vast areas in Syria, and they were coming after us, and they were beheading people. And people said, we don't want to send American ground forces to fight another war. And so what we did is we sent about 1,500 to 2,000 special operators to partner with the Kurds. And what we said to the Kurds is, you guys go in on the ground. If you will be the ground force, you will be the troops on the ground, we'll provide the air cover, and we'll defeat ISIS. And they agreed, and that's what they did. And they, they died. The, the people died, and, on, and then they, afterwards they agreed to man the camps and the jails where these captured ISIS killers were being held. But Erdogan has always hated them, particularly because they have links to a Kurdish group inside of Turkey and has always wanted to get their hands on them and on northern Syria. And we had 50 soldiers, more or less, in a two, check, two or three checkpoints on the border. And they were a tripwire force. As long as they were there, even though it was only 50, Turkey wouldn't come in. The president decided to pull the 50 people out, and by doing so, Create, in essence created a green light that allowed the Turks to come in and wipe these people out. So these people fought on the ground, sacrificed uh, on an issue that frankly wasn't their priority in partnership with us and afterwards we've now said to them now you're on your own to get wiped out and that's what's going to happen. So that's not, it's wrong. Number two, it, uh, it's going to have re repercussions in the region. It's actually started a war. It hasn't prevented a war. It started one. Number three, you're going to have thousands of ISIS killers who are going to be able to go free now because these Kurdish uh, guards at these prison camps are going to go fight to defend their, their cities, their villages, and their families. So they're going to abandon posts. These guys are going to get out. And number four, I don't know who else in this region is ever going to work with us again. The next time we go to some group in the Middle East and try to partner with them to take some anti-American actor on, they're not going to do it. They're going to remember this moment. So it's a, it was an enormous mistake. Long term, does it open a vacuum in that region for Iran to get a foothold? Well, Iran's already in Syria, and what I, where I do think it creates a, a foothold, foothold yeah. in the sense that we become increasingly appear unreliable. Like, why would I ever partner with the Americans? They will, they will abandon you when you need them. They're, they're, they want you when you, they need you, but when you need them, they won't be around. So that, that creates that space. It makes it us a less sort of reliable partner for many actors in the region. It also reinforces Iran's narrative that the U.S. is talking big but really wants to get out of the Middle East and that's why they've been daring, increasingly daring in some of the attacks they conducted against the Saudi Arabian uh, oil facilities, against the hijacking or the piracy against ships in the, in the, in the, in there in the, uh, in the Straits. So I do think it creates a problem in that, among numerous fronts. But right now you have an open war in, in northern Syria between Kurds and Turks and, and it's going to create, that, that sort of uncertainty is what creates the space for ISIS to re Reemerge. So, if our troops are not there, um, what what is our what what can we do? What do you see now as as the next move? I mean, uh, sanctions against Turkey. I mean, is well, that going to do anything? First of all, our troops. People have to understand when we talk about troops, this is not Iraq or Afghanistan. We're not talking about tens of thousands of people. We're talking about a small contingent force, largely of advisors and operators, uh, who aren't even fighting on the ground and also defending themselves. They're mostly providing guidance for the Kurdish fighters who were doing the ground fighting and and, and coordinating the airstrikes that helped truly degrade ISIS. By removing them from the border, even if you have the 2,000 and other parts of northern Syria, you've, a lot, you've basically green-lighted Turkey coming in and starting this whole conflict. It's going to get pretty bad. So as far as what Congress can do, look, the president is the commander-in-chief. And Congress can't order troops into combat. Congress can't reverse these decisions. And frankly, this one's in many ways irreversible. You can't all of a sudden resend the 50 Americans back to that post at this point. The Turks are already in there. Uh, it, it, we're it, it problematic. I'm not sure what we can do at this point, and that's why I've said that not only is it damaging it, parts of it, the damage is, is in the short term, midterm, is irreversible. Let's move on to impeachment. We've only got so much time we have to talk yeah. about this. Um, has the president, based on what we know right now, what was in the memo uh, of the call between the Ukrainian president and President Trump, based on what we know, has the president in your mind 
committed any impeachable offense. I don't think anyone can make that judgment right now, and I think it would be wrong for anyone to make that judgment. Impeachment is an extraordinary measure. You are basically invalidating an election. It's a political process. This is not a court case. So you make that decision not just on the basis of what happened, but you also make it on the basis of what's in the best interest of the country. And a lot of factors go into play, including the fact that all these things are out there and there's an election next year, which if you don't like someone is the best way to remove them from office. So that becomes a factor when it get, even when it gets to the Senate. I, I think where, where we're problematic now is you have a bunch of people out there that have either circled the wagons and said there's nothing to see here or, or have said I already, even though I don't have all the facts, I'm ready to do something this traumatic to the country. And I just think on something of this magnitude, of this importance, that would cause this amount of trauma and damage to an already polarized country, shouldn't we at a minimum at least wait until all the information is before us and then take some time to apply judgment to the, all of that on the basis of what is in the best interest of the United States at this moment in our history, given a lot of factors, including the fact that there's an election in about a year, and, uh, and, and by the time this is all resolved, less than a year. And it shocks me that something as traumatic as this has proceeded in, in a way in which people are rushing to judgment, even before they know anything other than what's in the press, on either side, for that matter. Uh, the White House is not uh, cooperating with the inquiry until Pelosi says we're bringing this to an actual vote. The White House is, is not turning things over, not allowing witnesses to, um, uh, to talk uh, to the House. Do you think Pelosi ever brings this to a vote? Oh, well, that's a decision she'll have to make. I, I'm not a member of the House. I have no idea. I can tell you that I saw that letter from the White House. And look, I'm not going to opine on everything that happens in the House because I'm not a member of it. We have a very different role in the Senate, even when they act. Um, but I can tell you that that letter was not a legal document. It was a political response to what, as of now, is a political process. In essence, there has been no vote, unlike what happened with Nixon, unlike what happened under Clinton, where the House took a formal vote, created parameters for an impeachment process, and moved forward on those grounds. Then both sides understand the ground rules are operating under. And Pelosi, in my view, hasn't brought it to that point because she knows that there's some Democrats that aren't ready to vote for it and because the vote will be almost entirely partisan. And so she's trying to have it both ways. She's trying to have an inquiry in which they can leak information as they see fit, but without any sort of constraints on how they operate and uh, without having to force some Democrats to vote on it. So my view is that the, the White House answer was a political answer to what so far has been a political exercise. That could change when we get back to D.C. next mm -hmm. week. But if you're going to be serious about this, then, then you should take a vote and as part of that vote lay out, as they did with Nixon, as they did with Clinton, the processes for collecting information, approving subpoenas, uh, and all the other things that go in a, in, a, in a process of this nature. So it sounds like you agree with um, the White House response so far to say we're not doing anything until you actually make this official. I think the White House is fighting back politically against what they view as a political exercise at this point. Remember, there is not an impeachment process underway. Right. There is a sort of informal impeachment uh, inquiry. But, but no vote. The House has not voted to even begin this inquiry. And that's not a formality. That's what they did under Clinton and under Nixon. And so the, if the Speaker is that serious about it, she should pursue it. It's the right way to do something like of this magnitude as opposed to litigate it with daily uh, leaks to the press on a regular basis. And, and then we'll see where the information leads, as I said at the outset of this interview. I think everyone should reserve judgment on this. Not a time to circle wagons. It's also not a time to sort of draw conclusions until you've seen everything before you and can make a judgment, not just on the evidence, but also on the circumstances in terms of what's in the best interest of the country. The president says he was not saying, get dirt on Biden. He didn't say that. He was saying instead to Ukraine, investigate corruption and investigate the beginnings of the interference into the 2016 election and and how this whole Russia collusion investigation got started in the first place. Would it be appropriate for the president to ask Ukraine's government to investigate the beginnings of Russia collusion? No, I wouldn't. If that was my phone call, I would not have done that. And, and I don't think he should have done that. That's that. That's different from saying, do you invalidate? Because this would, there, at, at, at its end conclusion, if you impeach and remove a president, do you wipe out the results of an entire election over that? 
That's a separate question. Is that in the best interest of the country? Now, I imagine that by the time this is all said and done, it won't just be about that. There'll be other things that are brought into it, partic including potentially the unwillingness of the executive branch uh, to turn over to Congress uh, relevant documents. An article of obstruction. But we're not at that point yet. And mm -hmm. so uh, I guess what I'm saying to everybody is this is not a political campaign, although there's a political process at this stage. This is a serious thing. I mean, wiping out an election result, particularly less than a year from an election in which that person's running for re-election, is a big deal. And no matter how it turns out, you're going to inflict substantial trauma on the country at a time when we already have major challenges and tremendous uh, division. Uh, maybe that's where we wind up. But before you do that, you should be judicious and careful and balanced about it and not just rush into it as a way to score points so you can run against the president uh, and say that um, you know we're running against a man who's been impeached or so you can circle the wagons and accuse you know, career intelligence officials of being a part of some sort of deep state coup. I think we have to take this as a serious thing, and right now it's not. It's being, um, by both sides, largely litigated through leaks and press statements. Now, the other thing going on that we're not hearing quite so much about, and I'm curious as to what you have heard or what you can say about this, is uh, the William Barr and John Durham investigation into where this Russia collusion investigation began. What are you hearing about this? Do you think there'll be movement on it within a year? Are we going to have anything on uh, FISA abuse perhaps coming out? Have you anything you can Actually, share? Actually, we shouldn't hear anything about it until it's, it's not, the decision is made because that's how you run a serious investigation. Whether you believe the investigation should occur or not, that's how you do a serious investigation. Should it occur? Well, if I don't have, I'm not, I haven't seen any information, they haven't provided any information on what the genesis of it is, but I would wait until they come forward and make, maybe they're going to come out and say there's nothing there. And then, but maybe they'll come forward with stuff I don't know about. My point is, when law enforcement is investigating someone, and that's what the Justice Department is, you don't litigate that in the press. You conduct an investigation, you gather the evidence, you make a decision, and then you make your announcement. Um, and, and that's how you conduct something that's serious. So I will wait until that happens and may make that decision before I opine on it. And until then, you know, it would be premature and irresponsible to opine one way or the other. On all these topics, we could uh, talk for hours, but I do want to move on to the growing influence of China. And uh, there's a lot to get to there, but I want to start out with what happened with the NBA this week. Essentially, there was a tweet by uh, the Houston Rockets, who very largely popular team in China, uh, the GM of that team supporting uh, um, the protesters in Hong Kong and, and their fight for democracy and the NBA came out and apologized for that. Um, I know you had a strong response to feeling like, you know, wait a minute, when did we start apologizing for supporting free speech in this country? Yeah, it's, it's actually deeper than the NBA. The NBA is obviously a high profile uh, actor in, in all this and so it can call attention. I want people to imagine for a moment that you work for a Marriott Hotel. And you, an employee, not an executive, just an employee of Marriott, go online and post something on your personal social media supporting the Hong Kong protest. And then China tells Marriott, if you don't fire this person, we're going to close down all your hotels in China, and you get fired. That's not a hypothetical. That happened. That happened about three and a half years ago. So what's happening now is it's not just that China is diminishing and going after free speech in China. Americans are being threatened with suspension, with loss of jobs, with loss of opportunities, because of things China doesn't like. That's unacceptable. Tied we had, to billions of dollars in contracts. Sure, but yeah. we, had, we had fans kicked out of games, NBA yes. games over the last two days because they held the a sign. If that sign would have said Marco Rubio's a terrible senator, they wouldn't have been kicked out. If that sign said Donald Trump's a terrible president or Nancy Pelosi's a terrible speaker, they wouldn't have been kicked out. But because they support Hong Kong, they get removed from a game? I mean, this is the country we want to live in. It's not hypothetical anymore. It's happening. And, and we, we need to wake up to it and deal with it. And I thought the commissioner's second response was much better and much more appropriate. And I wish they would have said that at the outset. And, uh, but this is going to, what happened, it's a big case and it'll matter because it'll set the trend for how others respond in the future, I hope. Now, speaking of Hong Kong, I believe you've introduced a bill that uh, would limit a special trade status with the U.S. unless uh, there are certain checks on, on democracy in, in Hong Kong. Um, explain how this yeah. would work exactly. So Hong Kong belongs to China, in essence, it, but it's autonomous. That was the deal they made with the world, and it's the deal they made with the U.K. And as a result of that autonomy, because they have democracy and they have self-governance, when something comes out of Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, be it a product or be it a service, 
it's treated differently than it came out of mainland China. It's not subject to tariffs or any sort of restrictions. What China is now saying is, we want to get rid of the democracy. We want to get rid of our end of the deal, but we want you to continue to treat us as separate from China. In essence, we want to break our end of the deal, but we want you to keep your end of the deal. That's ridiculous. And so my, all my law says is, every year the State Department has to certify whether or not Hong Kong remains autonomous. And the law takes care of the rest. If they're no longer autonomous, then we can no longer treat Hong Kong's economy as separate from the mainland. So it's just common sense. What, what is not common sense is to live in a world in which Hong Kong is not autonomous, but China continues to enjoy the benefits of a, an autonomy that no longer exists. Uh, China and our trade deal with China and the tr trade war with China right now, um, I believe they're making some concessions when it comes to agriculture. Uh, what is the end game here? What needs to happen and what do you see happening? Fairness. Uh, this is an, a necessary rebalancing of our relationship with China. Um, ultimately, in a perfect and a right outcome would be that our companies are treated in China the same way their companies are treated here. Our products are treated in China the way their products are treated here. And this is not just a trade dispute. We have a trade dispute with Germany. We have trade disputes with France, with Japan, with South Korea. This is much deeper than a trade dispute. This is a concerted effort by the Chinese to dominate the key industries of the 21st century at the expense of America, not by out-innovating us, not by out-competing us, but by cheating, by stealing our intellectual property, uh, by unfair trade practices like subsidizing their businesses while by, by forcing our businesses who operate in China to partner with their businesses who learn how to do it and then kick us out. Meanwhile, they want unfettered access and all the benefits of our system for their companies in the United States. So this is a rebalancing that's long overdue. It needs to happen now or frankly in five to ten years. We won't have to worry about it because we won't have a market to protect. They will have wiped it out. Can we get there? Can we get to fairness? I hope so. If we can't get to fairness, then we need to get to balance. In essence, if we can't work out a deal with, where they're going to treat us the way we treat them, then there are just things we're not going to be able to do with them. And I don't think that's a good outcome for the world. China's a big, important, powerful country. We're going to have to deal with them. That's a fact. This is not about containing China. But this is about having a balanced relationship because that lack of balance is dangerous. It will lead to conflict, economic, geopolitical, and potentially military at some point. So if you want peace and stability in the world, we need to deal with this now before it's too late. And they are dominating also in uh, global infrastructure, uh, rare earth materials. I know you have some appropriation bills to, to try and deal with this. Um, we, have to, we have to deal with these things. Explain why that rare earth and, and their global infrastructure um, their race to get ahead here basically is an issue for us. Well, because all of this technology that we rely on to give us both competitive and military, or economic and military advantages depend on these rare earth minerals that China now controls close to 80% of them in the world. Some of it because they have it in their territory, some of it because they've bought the mines and the operations in other countries, including a controlling interest in the largest rare earth mineral mine in the United States. And so if they cut off our access to that, I don't care how smart your software engineers are, how great your tech uh, innovators are, you won't be able to build the stuff because they own the materials for it. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there's so much more to worry about. You mentioned infrastructure. They're going all over the world, and what they do is they'll go into a country and they'll say, you want roads? We'll build you roads, even roads that make no economic sense because their road builders don't have to make a profit. The government of China is telling them, go ahead and do these deals even if you're losing money because that we are going to lend that country the money to build those roads and we're going to use Chinese workers to do it. And when they can't pay us back the loans, we'll basically have a mortgage on them. Now we own them. Now we can force them to vote our way at the UN. Now we can force them to give advantages to our companies. And another thing they do is they go in these countries and they just flat out bribe people. They, they basically bribe the political leaders to give them these contracts. So we have to have an answer to that that's legal. We're not going to bribe people. But that also understands the importance of it. And some of these countries are starting to figure out the debt trap that China lays for them. And they're looking for an alternative. And I think work has begun and beginning uh, through this, uh, what used to be called the uh, OPIC process, a, an alternative to that that doesn't require you to go into this sort of debt. Uh, it's probably going to cost a little more. Uh, because, but you're, you don't have to worry about bribes. You don't have to worry about the debt trap. And you're actually going to get a better product. All right. Senator Marco Rubio, we've taken up a lot of your time. No, we appreciate you. you coming by.